So Rhea, you've been away from mock trial as a competitor for the last couple of months, but you have not been away from mock trial uh, really at all. Uh, tell us what you've been up to. That is correct. Um, I have been doing all sorts of things. Um, I have still been doing mock on stuff. We just finished wrapping up a high school competition as of one hour ago tonight. So encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, the gladiator Olympics on YouTube um, I've been super lucky to have been staying involved with committees on the board. That's something that I've really been enjoying. So I encourage anyone who's interested in that route. Also, if you want to contribute to the community, it's a really, really fulfilling thing, um, to do once you're not a competitor. And last but not least, I am now coaching, which I am really, really enjoying for, uh, university of South Carolina. Um, so that's also been a really, really great experience. It's been super eye opening, I think for anyone who has transitioned from, competing to coaching to see what a big change it is not just in terms of like there's I think tangible improvements that I've noticed in myself things that I used to suck at that I've just gotten better at by virtue of practicing it in sort of a different form uh, but it's also I think a lot more gratifying in some ways to you know help other people succeed instead of sort of worrying about how successful you're going to be on your own so I'm really enjoying all of that so I'm going to do my best direct examination here I want to unpack some of the things you just said um, first, you said that you are you were running something called Gladiator Olympics. Tell us what Gladiator Olympics are. Yeah, sure. So um, Mock On was co-hosting Gladiator Olympics with Justin Bernstein and Will Warahay from Georgia Tech. Um, and Justin, obviously, who runs not just TBC, but also Gladiator, the high school version of that. Um, it was our first time doing an event like this. Um, essentially, what the competition was, was for those of us who remember Ages ago, back when COVID first uh, came to be, Justin had the incredible idea of hosting um, a video submission contest where he provided a case and then college competitors recorded themselves doing opens, closes, directs, et cetera, and they submitted it, were judged, and there was sort of a live bracket um, kind of thing. So we thought, what if we could bring that to the high school circuit, um, you know, just to sort of help, you know, make people more aware of Gladiator and do essentially the same sort of thing, but just at a different level of competition. That's what we did. Uh, Justin wrote a really, really incredible case. Um, it was about a sh uh, attempted murder at a political rally. Um, and then we had high school students around the country submit performances of themselves. So we had four categories. Uh, we had pretrial motions, opens, closes, and directs. Um, and then we had both of our final rounds Monday and Tuesday night of this week. Um, and then just an hour ago, we did our awards ceremony, um, where we announced our top three in each category, but there was a lot of really great, really, really great entries, people who I'm sure, and I hope to see competing in college very soon. Um, but, um, very happy with how the competition went and, you know, hopefully we'll keep it, keep it going. Is there any high school competitor, uh, that submitted a video to Gladiator Olympics that you would say specifically people should be looking out for, uh, in future watch mock episodes, potentially in their college rounds? <laughs> Um, it's hard to say. I think that there were a lot of really, really excellent ones. I will shout out two in particular. We also shouted them out at um, the award ceremony, but there was one student, his name is Jacob Molina from Dos Pueblos High School, who was our only person in the entire competition to make the finals in every single category. Um, so he was the only person to be represented in all four, which I think is really incredible. There were a lot of submissions. Um, so by no means was it an easy thing to do. And then the other person I'll shout out is Kayla Waddington. Um, I'll shout her out for two reasons. Number one, because her old teammate actually now competes for Emory and I've had the pleasure of meeting her many times and she's very, very talented and really excellent. Um, but Kayla won the gold medal. So she took home first place in two categories and she was the only person to do that. Um, excellent clothes and excellent witness um, on direct. So I'd say those two kids, if you're watching, I don't know how you'll find this, but if you do, then I hope you guys decide to um, compete in AMTA in just a couple of years. So I want to move to the second thing you said. You also said you're coaching the University of South Carolina. Why South Carolina? That's a great question. <laughs> so I'm in Atlanta. I coach them mostly through Zoom, but I see them in a lot of tournaments because we're both in the South. So I've actually been seeing them in person 
close to every other weekend now, which has been awesome. They're a lovely group of people. Originally, it's because I knew their head coach, Chance. Um, we've just been friends for a long time. Ben Wallace and I uh, work on Mock On together. So originally, once I was sort of dwindling down to the last um, part of my mock trial career, Chance actually reached out to me and said that if I was ever interested in coaching, um, that I should just let him know that we could make it work, even if we were in different cities. Um, and he was really willing to be super flexible with me. I think in the South, it's difficult to find a lot of different programs. Emory obviously is student run. So, um, but I think that, I think that it, it was just a really great fit in terms of what I was looking for now that I was like, you know, starting a new job and also wasn't really sure. I didn't want to be coaching by myself. I wanted someone who could kind of show me the ropes and teach me what I was supposed to do. And Chance is one of the best coaches that I've ever met in my life. Um, so it's just been really, really great so far. So what is your role on USC's coaching staff? So it's really nice. I have a lot of flexibility. Chance has been really great about that. Um, Chance is the head coach, obviously. I'm an assistant coach in the program. But really, I mean, it's it's not super different than what I was doing as a competitor at Emory. I think I help them, all the teams with their content, um, workshop different things, still spend many nights using voice memos on my phone, drafting speech bits. Um, so it's really honestly not all that different. The only really difference, at least from my perspective of things, is that when it comes time for the tournament, instead of doing the stuff that I wrote, someone else is doing the stuff. So I think that um, it's a great group of people. They're all super talented. I personally, not just because I'm coaching them, but also just because I love them, I'm really looking forward to see how the Gamecocks do this season. I think that they have had a really great invite season so far. So I think they stand a really great chance that, you know, when it comes down to the AMTA season. But yeah, honestly, from from my perspective, nothing is really that different. <laughs> So Travis, you're also not competing this fall, uh, or you haven't competed this fall yet, I should say. Tell us why. Um, yeah, I think like everybody that competes in mock trial, especially at a high level where you're like practicing a lot, knows how much time and just like energy it takes. And I think that um, you know, I just put like kind of my everything into mock trial. I think my sophomore, honestly, freshman, freshman, junior year, like it was the only thing I did, like besides a few other things, like I was always doing mock trial and honestly, like, and it paid off. It was amazing. Like we had a great season, um, literally like did accomplish everything that I've ever literally ever wanted to do in mock trial. Um, but like, I, I think I have this moment where I started working over the summer where I was like, wow, I also just like have so many other things in life that are just like weighing on me, like getting a job after graduation and applying to law school. And um, also just like spending time with friends and like our last like time together on campus, especially after being away for an entire like year, basically my sophomore year. So I think it was just more just a break. It was, you know, it wasn't like me stepping away for a very long time. I just needed like a, a few tournaments just, you know, go back to being a full-time student again, and not um, full-time mock trial competitor, part-time student. Um, and also I like, I sing in an acapella group and- um, It's a great acapella group. They're called the Opportunes. Everyone should go check them out. I'm your biggest fan. Um, yes. Travis's acapella group comes up on my TikTok feed every single day. And I'm obsessed with I, I've seen the, I've seen the TikToks and I'm also I have a fan. in fact traveled to New York just to watch Travis's acapella group compete. Wow. Dedication. Nice. So I'm a dedicated fan. <laughs> yes, like the week the week after Ampton Nationals were actually acapella nationals and my acapella group was performing at that nationals as well. And so many mock trial people literally came to New York because they were in the Northeast, just around. They just like wanted to come see and like watch my acapella competition the next weekend. Like where they was... play second place in the country, by the way. Just a shout out Travis's amazing acapella group. I'm such a big fan of his acapella group that after they finished, the first person I congratulated was actually one of Travis's acapella teammates who I'd seen a video do like a cover of and I loved it so much that I just like I talked to her before I even talked to Travis. All right, I have a, I have a couple follow-ups. Okay. Uh, uh, Travis, are you better at acapella or mock trial, do you think? <laughs> That's such a funny question. Um, like, honestly, um, I don't know. They're different. They're so different. They're different. And, like, I feel like people fit into, like, the group in different ways. Like, I think that in mock trial, I definitely was, like, more of, like, a, like, a leader, captain type. But in opportunities, it's, like, 
there's not really as much of that like leader like vibe and more of just like creative like input and like arranging and stuff so it's just like different skill sets I think across the two I think they're very different though and both like also take similar amounts of time which is crazy <laughs> okay so here's my next question you're in on stage you're within a, in a uh, audience full of strangers who have never seen the group Maybe they're not even acapella fans or fans of the genre or anything like that. And you've got to do one song to make them fans. What's your go-to? Okay, so we actually saw this song in New York. Um, we used, did this song called Where Have You Been? Well, obviously, Where Have You Been by Rihanna. But like, it's really good. Um, yeah, it's like very different. It's like this like kind of like intense pounding like spooky like girl boss version of where have you been where like Issa who won outstanding soloist like three times in a row for that song like belt this crazy high like diva note in the middle that like is so crazy and astonishing so I would say that song okay last question uh after a law school is done do you think it's more likely you will stay involved with acapella or more likely you will stay involved with mock trial Oh, I mean, I think in terms of being actively involved in like the acapella community, like I would definitely say mock trial. I think there's less of a like acapella community outside of my like own group, like that than there is for mock trial. Like in mock trial, like me and Rhea are good friends, me and Ben are good friends. I could literally list like so many people in mock trial that like I just know and like love and like like am so grateful to be in community with. And like not that I don't like people that do acapella, but like that same like outside of like your group connection like doesn't as much exist. So I definitely see myself like being involved with mock trial like well after graduation, whether that's like coaching or just judging or whatever it is. Um, so, but I'm definitely gonna come back to like my own personal acapella group all the time, definitely. Back to the boring stuff. Uh, <laughs> when do you expect you're gonna return uh, to the competition circuit here? Um, so probably sometime in, the spring or late fall so in the next few tournaments so like maybe like that first weekend in december like weekend where there's a few tournaments like i think cubate and yale um either that weekend or like in the january for like gcfi or something like that well, is it sort of contingent on how how quickly you can sort of like in in sports like pitcher needs to ramp their arm up for you know before they can start pitching in a real game or you need to get in game shape like is it like contingent on how quickly you think you can get ready well, I, so admittedly, like, for example, I haven't read the case in its entirety yet. Like, <laughs> I, I just, I haven't, I, I, I have, haven't been competing, so I haven't done that. Um, Kudos to you. Like, I don't know that I would have had the self-control to not do that. And I, I give you tons of credit for stepping away for a little bit and actually stepping away and not yeah. like still kind of half doing it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, for, for those reasons, like I, I definitely need a little bit of time to like get ready. And also just like that coincides with finals in college. So it's just, it, it's a rough time, but I think, I think I should be competing at the December tournament. I I'm trying to get my stuff together now. <laughs> so I get you talked about December, you talked about the spring. Do you think you'll be competing at trial by combat in June? I am not sure. I think so. I really want to. Um, but like, I think um, it, it, I, I don't know where I'm going to be this summer. Like I might be tra like doing a travel fellowship or something. So like, honestly, it depends on like what happens after that. But like, I love travel by combat. It was like one of the most like life changing experiences I've ever had, <laughs> um, honestly. Um, and also, um, you know, like, if I did decide not to go to trial by combat, like there's so many people on my team also that I think would be amazing if like they went as well. Um, so um, not to say that I don't, I, I would love to do it. I literally just don't know. I just have to get a job and a fellowship first and see where that leads me. But um, yeah. I'm trying to my best to break news on the show and I just <laughs> can't do it. Uh, I'm so sorry. I wish I could give you answer. We still, have a, we still have a whole episode uh, left to go. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about before we talk, get into the the, the trial that we're going to watch is your trial by combat coach, Sarah Stebbins, who's currently a UCLA law student who is winning everything. Uh, what's it like working with Sarah and how has she changed you as a competitor? Ah. Uh. Oh, there's so much to say. I started working with Sarah when I was in high school because we are alums of the same high school, Atlanta International School. And when I was a senior, 
um, Sarah and Liam Simpkins Walker, who was at Furman for a while, um, uh, who was a competitor at Furman, um, and also Ben Felder, who was a competitor at Georgia Tech, but didn't go to AIS. Um, they all coached my high school team. And that was kind of basically my first introduction to AMTA. Like, I remember seven, like Sarah was the first person that told me what perjuries was at the time and like orcs and like regionals. And like, I remember my senior spring of high school, I went, I went to Decatur regionals actually um, to like go watch Sarah and her team at orcs. Um, so me and Sarah go way back. <laughs> um, and even though she hadn't been coaching me for um, kind of like, the past, like the the two years, first two years of college, like I still credit Sarah and Liam, like with so much of like my knowledge in this activity. Like they taught me so much, not just like, especially like in terms of like how AMTA differs from high school. And like, like I, I remember just Sarah, like sitting down, sitting me down and like telling me like all of these things that are different in AMTA than in high school. And like just preparing me for it. Cause I was so excited to do mock trial in college. Um, but I think that going to TBC, like, I I just wanted to have a obviously we don't have coaches on my program um and but I was really weary of just bringing all current competitors because like I think there is something I there is something that could be said about like I'm I've never been to law school right I none of us have like there are some things and like I can attest to the fact that like there are some things that Sarah like I would have no idea what I would have said if Sarah was not there like Sarah explained things to me she made things clear to me um, and also I think Sarah just knew me as a competitor because she had known me for so long and was able to like, I think we have different styles as competitors, but like she knew my style so well that she was able to like help me write material that really fit me. Um, and I just think me, Sarah and Stella, even though Stella and Sarah never competed together, like just beautifully made this beautiful like dynamic um, somehow. And like it literally felt like we were all friends, even though like <laughs> Sarah and Stella never met each other. So. Yeah, yeah. I saw you compete for the first time as a high school student in 2019. Yeah. Oh, um, that's a deep cut. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Gladiator 2019, where Liam yeah. was the coach. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna watch the final round on the show pretty soon. Never before seen footage, uh, and I'm really excited about it. But when I went back to watch it to prepare for that episode, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot Travis was a witness in that round, and I forgot that was the first time I'd seen you. And we're gonna watch the semifinal from Trial by Combat um a few months ago and when i when i watched it back to prepare for the episode the thing that struck me so much is there's so much of sarah in in the way that you compete uh in this round and i mean i drexel and, and ucla are, are, are close programs and i've seen a lot of sarah over the last couple of years for lots of reasons and um I, there's so many similarities in, in certain things that you did and certain strategy decisions that you guys made um and i just thought it was so super cool to to see that um and I'm really excited to to see if she is your coach for the next one. Um, you do that even more. Okay, so we're going to start by watching Travis's cross of the prosecution witness uh, played by Sarah Campbell from Yale. Fire attack. Saw someone approach Mr. Capello from behind, strangle him with something, and then leave in that same dark sports car that I just described. They identified the, the attacker as around 5'10", white, male, and around 180 pounds. And he said that identified the attacker as being 5'10", white, male, around 180 pounds. Did the defendant match any of those descriptions? Yes. The defendant is around 5'10", white, male, and 180 pounds. Are you aware of any other identifying characteristics of that attacker? Uh, we found forensic evidence at the scene of footprints that were left a size 11 shoe. Do you know what size shoes the defendant wears? Size 11. So, Ma'am, after recovering all of that evidence, what did you do? Uh, we charged Augie Shepard with murder and witness retaliation in October. Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, we have no further questions at this time. Cross-examination. Yes, ma'am. Travis, your table is so much neater than mine. <laughs> Just what is that? Good afternoon, Marshall. Um, what, what is Sarah writing on your legal pad there, do you think? That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. There were a lot of things being written during this round. The thing is, like, so the thing about TBC that I think a lot of people don't understand, and I don't know, maybe this is just my experience at TBC, but, like, I feel like this trial by combat was my third trial by combat. 
first time I went as a coach, second was as a competitor. This was my third time as a competitor. Every single time, every round that I've witnessed when I was coaching for Elias and when I was actually in the round, I don't really understand what's happening. Like <laughs> there's very few times where I'm like in the round and I'm like, oh, like this is what he's saying. Here's how I respond. Usually I just like say things like I, I don't really. So Sarah is much better at like understanding what's happening generally so she was probably explaining to me like something that was happening that I just wasn't like she, she's, she's <laughs> writing like this is Travis he's about to cross-examine cross-examine honestly is not that unrealistic of a possibility <laughs> like, get after like, that I'm going to dump straight into your investigation because ma'am you're not an expert in organized crime are you no I'm not you actually retained one of those experts true we did yes I want to talk about what that expert did and did it say it's true that expert she says mob killings they're usually done with a knife or a gun right she said that's usually the case she said it's actually unusual for mob killings to be done with jumper kings uh, she did say that it was unusual but that given the circumstances that augie shepherd had found the decedent while they were in witness protection uh, that the murder weapon could have been different because of that specific circumstance and we couldn't have bought a knife or a gun in any store in l.a uh, I believe in the report, our expert identified certain characteristics, such as the time period, the fact that the decedent was in witness protection, that meant the murder might, ha might have had to have happened quickly, so the murderer might have used whatever was on hand. The expert also said that mob hits, they're not usually done by the boss of the mob, right? Uh, that's what the expert said, but we didn't find any evidence that any of the workers of Augie Shepard were in LA at that same time period, that he was the only member of the Bruno crime family who was there when the decedent was killed. But that's yes, that expert said, it's unusual. To, um, shout out Sarah Campbell. Just she's like- a great she, witness. She, she she's was so good. so good in like, like ba d definitely made my job like a hundred times harder, like just by her witnessing. Like, I think it was just such a beautiful, like, like matching of like, like me as a crosser and her as just like a, like a killer witness that was really giving me a hard time and i think it's just so fun to watch like i literally was just like watching i was like this is so good like <laughs> i love it for the yeah, boss to admit the hit, right? uh, yes that usually would be unusual but it's your testimony that uh, mr shepherd he's a mob boss right uh, yes that's what we believe it's your testimony that he didn't order a hit right uh, no, we believe he didn't order a hit, but we also find no evidence that any other members of the DeBruno crime family were in L.A. at that same time period. You don't believe that he maybe called someone and borrowed the so to L.A.? funny about this round, Travis, and, like, now I'm really realizing it as I'm, like, seeing your cross again. Like, I thought, like, definitely for the semifinal, like, Travis and I are very, we competed against each other, like, many, many times back when we were both still doing it, and, like, we're so similar as competitors stylistically. Like, we both have the same exact, I think strengths and the same exact weaknesses in every round. So this was very much like, I thought like a fire against fire kind of round. Like we're both very flashy, I think very like performance heavy kind of competitors, which is so it's like, we're competing against like ourselves. <laughs> in this round. We both lie rampantly to ourselves. <laughs> no. It's happened frequently in this round. No, definitely. I think that like, like that, I don't, not only it's like are we it's like fire against fire is such a perfect way to put it it was just like just flashy and performative honestly like also i'm noticing i'm speaking so fast like if i was watching myself i would have been like also slow down which makes sense given that the high pressure no we literally <laughs> both do that i like yes. when, I, when i look back at parts of like this round that i did too i had the same exact thing it's funny because normally travis crosses me because travis crossed experts a lot during the year and then I, whenever we scrimmage and stuff he would end up crossing me so we didn't get to attorney against each other very much but this was one of the first we got to do that but it's still like super similar yeah to fly him out right we didn't find any evidence of that no. no you think that the mob boss went to this person's house by himself and killed him with his own two hands that's what gets your testimony man given the personal relationship between barry capello the decedent and augie shepherd yes that's what we believe so i want to talk about whether or not the forensic evidence matches that story because marshall you have a lot of experience in criminal investigation true i do yes and i'm sure you were thorough with your collection of evidence in this case, right? We were. You looked at Mr. Capello's car. We did. Looked at his home. We did. Looked at Mr. Shepard's car. We did. Looked at Mr. Shepard's home. Well, Mr. Shepard lives in Pennsylvania and the focus of our investigation was the crime scene in LA. So you didn't actually check Mr. Shepard's home? Uh, no, Mr. Shepard wasn't near or around his home at the time of the crime. So that's a no, you didn't check Mr. Shepard's home. 
No. Again, this murder was committed in L.A., where Mr. Shepard was at the time. But I'm sure he also checked the, his hotel room, right? Uh, we checked his hotel room, but we didn't find any evidence. So I want to talk about what you didn't find in all of those places. Because in all, the place, all of those places. Um, sorry, Phil. What's interesting about um, this pocket is because I remember reading this um, expert, and like I feel like for most cop crosses, it's like you just kind of pull out anything that a cop would reasonably do that they don't list in their affidavit and like cross them on the fact that they didn't do it, right? Because it's not an affidavit, so it's an omission. Um, but this extra was particular in that there was a specific line that was like, I actually did everything I was supposed to do. And if I didn't include that I did it, it's because it didn't yield any in important evidence. And like me, Sarah and Seller were like, hmm, so how do we still do the same thing? But like, around this line and I think that the solution that we came up with that I really enjoyed was like basically using it in the converse of not to say you didn't search it but that like you did search all of these places that we're picking out of that are not an affidavit that we just like came up with because obviously they're going to say yes if they like to the expansiveness of their investigation oh so, and, I see what you're saying yeah oh, to say specifically that really didn't find anything in all of those places as opposed to saying like you didn't search there you didn't find anything at all um which yeah. I, thought was really I didn't even think about that that's really smart yeah definitely smart and since you brought it up Travis I'm going to use this as an opportunity to um give a PSA and to get on my high horse for just a minute if you'll indulge me um, I think case writing is like the most important thing in terms of making tournaments work. And far too often, not in the AMTA circuit, but in the high school circuit and in the law school circuit, especially case balance is determining winners. And the number one thing you aspire in case writers that you can do to make your cases play well, the number one thing that you can do is make your law enforcement witnesses competent. Don't make them say things like, oh, the victim is actually my mom. And so I just decided the defendant was guilty. Like, or I didn't search the defendant's house because I just forgot, like just make them competent. And so this is not the first time that Justin and I wrote the law enforcement witness at combat to have that line in, in the witness statement that says, I did all any, I, I didn't list any investigative steps that didn't yield evidence. That way you couldn't cross-examine on incompetence. It, it would require you to do exactly what you did and what you think about it. Um, and you try to use that to your advantage, but you don't just get the, you didn't do this. You didn't find fingerprints. You didn't dust for this. You didn't look for DNA. You didn't do this. Um, and in the law school circuit, it's just like cop crosses are just like automatic tens because everybody, every case writer writes the cop or the law enforcement witness incompetent. Um, so case writers out there, uh, write your write your cops to be good cops, the best cops on earth. The defense will find a way to cross examine them, um, and uh, I'm sure I, I'm sure I solved the problem with that PS. <laughs> Can you guys pick witnesses for the cases? Do you like? I feel like you've like been asked this question before and answered it, but I don't remember what you said. When you guys like pick your witnesses, do you pick it based on the field, or do you just decide independent of? You know what I mean. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, Justin and I have never discussed the field, like the the students coming to the tournament when deciding who the witnesses are. Um, I think for the most part, we want witnesses who are sort of blank slates where we can. And obviously a, a U.S. Marshal is not exactly that, um, but the, the witness on the other side is the... Um, Documentary person from 2020 is a good example of that. So I think we're just trying to find witnesses that can be played in a lots of different ways. Um, but that's interesting. Um, if there's someone who's really good at, at a specific thing, uh, you know, a, if putting that kind of witness in the case would obviously be a big advantage. We've never really had a crier in the case. Um, well, I, I thought that the P witness, at least the way I feel like the, or whichever witness was the- like, It was the, last year. Last That's year, like the friend. Job. Yeah. Um, I remember that, like, at least for me, like, I definitely played that. Right. Yeah. Time. That actually, that's a, that's a, you're right. You guys are yeah. correcting me on my own case. That definitely <laughs> was a crier. <laughs> yeah. But you, uh, but the good thing about that, like, in terms of case writing, is you didn't have to play that witness like that. Sure. You could have played it as sort of just like a friend, like a kid. I think that this year's D witness was a really good example of that, where, like, <laughs> I will admit that. I didn't do the most conventional take on that witness, but I think like half the field was doing very like sad takes and then 
I chose to go a comedic route, which was may maybe not <laughs> advisable, but I know Murray also, I think did like a different route with that one. So I saw a lot of people doing different things. Yeah. Um, by the time this episode has come out, the, hopefully the episode with Bennett Dembski and Thomas Azari has come out uh, watching their, their round. And Rhea, I have to admit, maybe Bennett told you this already, but I, I, my I, Marshall's I, badge. Yeah. I kind of roasted you. Marshall's badge. Can I just, can I just roast Rhea for just like a second? <laughs> just, I want to just roast her about something very small. And it's, it's more, not a, really a roast Rhea thing. It's a, it's a roast the Amto witness community thing. What I don't understand is why the law enforcement witnesses wear like the, you can't see it in this video, but when she walks to the stand, you can see it. The, the badge around their necks. And then just for like the same thing they would wear to court also. Like why would, why would you have like a suit on with like the badge and like not the rest of the cup? Wait, yet? is that not a- Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I, was- I promise you Phil, like 0.2 seconds of thought went into that. Yeah, so Bennett did tell me that he allegedly proved you wrong. So he did. So I so uh, for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, I roasted Rhea for in the in the round in in round one with between Bennett and Thomas for wearing a badge with like the normal suit get up, and I didn't think that law enforcement witnesses would do that. And Bennett proved me wrong and found a picture on Google Images of a U.S. Marshal wearing a suit and a badge. So I, I was wrong. I apologize on the show, and I'm apologizing to you. Thank face you, to Bennett, face for defending my honor. Jeez. Yeah, he's a good and the, thing, the funniest thing is that the badge I think like broke for my round three, but I wanted to give it to for the semifinal actually against Travis, and I wanted to give it to Sarah so she'd like have something. But then it like wasn't working. And I think Ollie Alekri just like happened to be sitting in the audience. And I asked him like, Ollie, can we use your patch for this round? And so I think the one that if Sarah is wearing it right now, it's not hers. It's I'm pretty sure it's Ollie Alekri's. So thank uh, you, Ollie. Also, that'll be a really good trivia question in like 20 years. Yeah. Trial by combat, like 24. Whose badge is this? Whose badge is that? <laughs> All right. Back, back into this. You didn't find any DNA linking Mr. Shepard back to this crime. No, we didn't. All uh, those places, you didn't find any fingerprints to tie Mr. Shepard back to this crime? No, but I want to be clear. The, the eyewitness identifies the attack, attacker as someone wearing gloves, so we wouldn't expect to find fingerprints. Well, ma'am, in any of your searches, you didn't find any gloves, did you? Uh, no, we didn't find any gloves. You didn't find any clothes that matched the description of the attacker? No, again, Mr. Shepard left L.A. soon after the murder. We didn't find anything like that in his hotel room. You didn't find any security footage from the hotel showing that he had left? Right. No, there were no security cameras at the exits. You didn't find any security footage from the neighborhood to see if he was there? No, there were no security cameras, unfortunately, on the street where the decedent lived. So I want to talk about that eyewitness you mentioned earlier. You said that that person, they saw the entire attack, right? Uh, that's what they described, yes. You said that they saw a green car? I said that they saw a dark colored sports car. So let's be a little bit more specific, ma'am. That eyewitness. They actually said it was dark, right? They did say it was dark outside. It was around midnight. You asked them, uh, well, what color was the car, right? Uh, and they said they couldn't quite tell because it was dark outside, but they could tell that it was a dark colored sports car. Well, first he said, well, I think it's black, right? Yes, he said that it could have been black under the lighting. And, and not just that, ma'am. He said, well, I don't know what the make is, right? He couldn't identify the particular make, but he said that it was a sports car, perhaps a Ferrari. So he couldn't tell you the make of the car? No, he couldn't. Couldn't He was, my apologies. He said he wasn't a car guy. Couldn't tell you the model of the car? No. Couldn't tell you any other details except for a dark- you remember this many facts from the affidavit? (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, well, this goes back to a trait that we share, (laughs) Rhea. This goes back to a trait that we share, Rhea, which is radical confidence. (laughs) Oh, radical confidence. was not in it? (laughs) Um, I just- I like, this thing about the black car, like when you were doing this in the cross in the moment, like, I was like low-key zoned out because I was thinking I was trying to like, I was trying to find places to object, which just didn't exist for P in this case, I think. So I made a really stupid one at some point and it was bad. But um, for this, like the black car changing the make, I literally like didn't recall that being in the case. I feel like it's one of those details. And I was like, as I was watching that whole exchange from you and her, I was like, how did Travis remember that this was in the case? How did Sarah remember this was in the case for a witness she was asked to play like 10 minutes ago? Yeah, I I think I honestly like 
don't even think that we had planned to go into that much detail. Like, I think, I think the only reason, actually, I know exactly what happened. It was because she said, it, Stella asked room. It always comes back to Stella asked room because <laughs> Stella heard that Sarah said green on direct. And Sarah was like, hmm. Stella was like, hmm. She didn't say green, like in classic Stella fashion, and goes to the affidavit and it's like, ha, she doesn't, he doesn't say green. He actually says black. And then I don't know what. And so she showed that to me. And then I would, that's why I got the legal pad when. Oh, um, yes. 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 interesting. Yes, yeah. so, second um, chair, so, the, the unsung heroes. I, yeah, like, literally a million percent. I don't know how I could have done that tournament both years without Stella. She was so, so amazing. Um, Colored luxury car, right? Yes, a dark colored sports car, and that matches the description of the car the defendant was driving. So uh, let's actually turn to his ident identification of the perpetrator. Because, man, you said that he identified that the description matched Mr. Shepard? He identified someone that was white, male, around 180 pounds, and around 5'10. Well, that man, matches the description of Augie Shepard. You know, he actually wasn't sure of this person's skin color, right? He said that he only got a glimpse of the back of the assailant's neck, and from what he could see, he seemed to be white, but he wasn't exactly certain. He said, I can guess he's white, but I'm not sure, right? Yes, like I said, he said he only saw the back of his neck, so he wasn't exactly certain. Couldn't see his hair, right? He said that he could tell that his hair was dark. He saw him from behind, but couldn't tell me a specific hair color. He said, I'm not sure what it was, but I guess it was dark, right? He said that, yes, it was dark outside. Again, this happened. Uh, this, like, pocket is such a thing that I feel like I, re I, like, rely on so often in Cross when, like, I'm trying to think of how to make something interesting, which is instead of, like, saying it as facts, like, reenacting exactly what happened, I think it's such a fun way to, like, make it a lot more, like, dramatic and like also yeah. like I don't know I feel like I, I'm also like I think one of my strengths as a competitor is like my emotiveness and like emotion and like I think being able to like just like say the quotes as they as they ostensibly would have said it is like a way for me to literally just like be be an actor like in the middle of the well which I think is really really fun yeah it really brought the like sort of uncertainty of the idea to, to life um and I think it I mean I think it made that point a lot stronger than it otherwise would have been. I mean, the fact that the witness sees a dark colored sports car is, is kind of pretty good, um, like a pretty good idea, but it made it seem really shaky. Yeah. Just just by the way he performed it. At midnight. So I guess his hair was dark, right? Yes, he said that he had dark hair. And most importantly, man, he didn't even see this person's face, right? No, because the attacker came up to Mr. Capello from behind, he only saw him from the back. So that's a yes. That eyewitness didn't even see this person's face at all. No, never saw the face. And it's true in cases like these, you sometimes try to get eyewitnesses to identify the suspect, right? If that's possible, yes. And you know, that eyewitness, he did an identification, true? Uh, he was shown a picture of Mr. Capello, as well as the defense. Travis, one of the things that you do really well in this cross that I think is a, a subtle thing, but I think it's a really important technical thing, is you have a witness who is um combative and evasive at times very evasive at times and you do a very good job of not over controlling of resisting the urge to over control um when i'm teaching new students how to to witness control the first sort of thing is they just don't do it and then once they realize that they have to do it they do it too much and it's finding that sweet spot in terms of when to let stuff go and because it's going to be grading if you could have controlled sarah here 45 times in a row on, on, on various answers that she gave. And I think sort of finding that sweet spot and just demonstrating to the scoring judges that you can do it five, six times over the course of a 70 question cross is, was useful. Did you find that hard on this cross? Um, I think that, I, I, I think that it was hard. I think that I definitely was restraining myself from controlling more than I wanted to, but I think that also like, I, I think that I'm also the kind of competitor where like, I also think when I witness control too much, it like also messes me up sometimes. Cause like I get off a track on my script in my head and where I'm trying to go. And so like, it's half, like, I don't want to be grading and say, is that a yes after every question? And it's also half, like, I don't want one me to get off of track of my story, but also for the jury and the judges to get off track of my story. And like, I think it's a, especially if the, unless the answer is like, 
so long where you forget the question, which happens, which happens. Like, and there were moments where I did control Sarah, like if that needed to happen, it's like, I feel like it's so much easier and like keeps the flow of the cross going if you basically just, I mean, like the way it was first taught me is like ignoring what the witness said and just keep on going. Cause like, it's classic cop answers, like nothing like too like, unless there's an answer that I think is like particularly damaging or like is really, really good. Like everything was just like right. standard cop, cop stuff, so. And then a couple of other people that showed a front view. Yes. Right. Detectives showed him a photo of Mr. Capella. Right. Yes. That photo, it's important to know, it was taken from the front. And he only ever saw the assailant from the back. Showed him a photo of, uh, of Mr. Shepard, right? Yes, Mr. Shepard was in the photo. They said, tell me who you recognize in this photo. True? Yes, that's what they said. And he said that he didn't recognize anyone except for the decedent, Barry Capella. Right. Well, let's break that down. He certainly didn't say, oh, that's the person that I saw, right? No, again, this photo was from the front view, and he only ever saw the assailant from the back. He said, I, I recognize my neighbor. True? Yes, that's what he said. But I don't recognize anyone else in this photo. That's what he said. No, he said he didn't recognize the defendant by a front view. So he didn't recognize anyone else in that photo except for Mr. Capella. True? Yes, that's true. But then he said, why don't you take a second look? Isn't that true? Uh, they asked specifically if the defendant, Augie Shepard, was the person they saw in the night. Oh, they said, look at this person here, right? They identified him by his his lineup in the picture, and they asked if that was That's the so person good. that this is like a show. That's one thing they I said, look at man know. number three. Are, are you sure? Watching your crosses, Travis, is that like, and like, I don't know how to, ex I'm sure that anyone who like competed on Zoom and like was part of the cohort of us that did both, like in person and Zoom, the first time I ever saw Travis compete in person was at UGA. Um, my senior year we had, I was actually filling in for a teammate. So I wasn't even supposed to be competing that weekend, but we fortuitously had a round um, Emory versus Harvard. And that's when I saw Travis compete in person. I think you were also filling in for someone that weekend, Travis, weren't you also filling in? Yeah, I was middling. I was, like, <laughs> I was also middling. Yeah. We were both filling in for teammates. And I can't begin to tell you like how impactful a style like Travis's is, is especially in person when you're like experiencing it like it's like a performance it's not just like it's not it's it, it becomes about more than just you know the facts but like something like that like is where the in-person versus footage difference just really like I mean on the footage it's impressive in itself but like in the room you can just like feel it in a way that I think is just so rare yeah I also think that zoom um in addition to the obvious stuff like it limits you physically and things like that I, agree, I, agree. I also think it just dulls the drama a little bit so yeah. one of the things that I would tell my teams um, for Zoom competitions is we everything we do, we have to do even more over the top on, on Zoom because it's just not gonna, it doesn't it's not as effective. Um, I think that something about the camera that sort of dulls everything. Um, but I I agree. Like watching competitors who are super dynamic like Travis, it's just a whole different thing in, in the room. Totally. I feel like so much of like. I don't know. I just always go back to the fact that I started doing mock trial because of theater and like, because like my like theater, like the mock trial coach came into like a rehearsal that I was having for a play and was like, come be a witness for us. And like, I think that like, when I think of why I love mock trial and like, like it's literally just because of that performative element. Like it literally feels like, like you're on, like in a lot of ways you are on stage, right? But like being able to like bring people into that performance and like also like I think just also in my day to day life I'm also just a very loud <laughs> person, <laughs> dramatic person. So there's that too. Or <laughs> it's not him. They asked him if he looked familiar. Yes. And he said, oh, "I guess that could be the person I saw, right?" Yes, he said he wasn't sure, but that could perhaps be the assailant. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, and I have nothing further. Any redirect? So on the, uh, if the, is it better or worse than where have you been? Would you say watching that cross? <laughs> um, that's really funny. Um, I, I would say, honestly, honestly, like, where have you been at finals? We kind of like messed up because the room wasn't good. So I'll say that was better than where have you been. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not what I was expecting Thanks. you to say. I think that the, it's also just because like I sang where have you been so many like like I've sent done it so many times so like there are some that maybe there are some performances that are better than that one but honestly we were watching that I'm like I feel like I was so stressed in the moment that I could not take in what I was actually doing so it's like interesting this is my first That's time 
Not that's so right. true. Like when you're in the moment and especially like, I've never had that feeling anywhere except trial by combat, except maybe nationals at AMTA. Um, that said, even nationals, I still haven't felt that kind of like the, the way that everything is just a blur. Like you really don't know, like so much of like, so much of what everyone says in every round and every single piece of footage you can watch from TVC is improvised, is made up, is something that they didn't prep, is something they came up 10 minutes ago, is something they took from another round that they were witnessing in before. Like I did that. Like there's so many times when like, it just goes by so quickly. You have so little time in between to like readjust. Um, like time is such a valuable resource and you never have enough of it. So like literally like you can come up with a pocket in the middle of a cross or two minutes before, and then you just have to be able to like do it without scripting it or anything. Um, and that's just the way it goes. Like it's, everything is such a like haze in the moment. Like, I feel like when I watch back some of the clips from combat, like there's stuff that I said that I'm like, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> like, oh. why did I say that? Oh, for like yeah. so many different like I said this like I didn't remember saying I, I feel the same way about the Top Gun like it's kind of in some ways horrifying that that's the only round of of me on the internet because I'm just like slurring and I, I'm so I'm like so tired and I'm like uncharacteristically fast and all that kind of stuff and um, I think the thing with, with like a cross like this is you forget that this is on two days prep um, and it just even that much if this if this were a national cross no one would be surprised i agree to, to like see it, that. It, it's, yeah it's just it's just really crazy that you know you guys are able to do this on such short prep at such a high level it's so funny because just before this juliana had seen me do like an atrocious witness um and like i think that a lot of it's funny because then i used an objection the sleeping objection i made travis that was an objection. I, Juliana, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I stole that from Juliana because I couldn't think of any objections to make to defend. So I was like, Juliana did this and it got sustained. So I'm going to do it too. And I did it. <laughs> That's how it works. So even at my, <laughs> my very first gladiator, like very first time, I remember I witnessed for Audrey Shepard and then she like did some cross pocket that was really good. And I was like, okay, next round, doing that cross pocket. I did that, that with Bennett. Nice. Like Bennett crossed me on a pocket. Um, and I was like, this is so good. And then I like did it on a direct with Varun, except in that situation, it was a direct and it was an egregious material invention. So it wasn't the same thing exactly. But I was just so inspired. <laughs> happens to all of us. <laughs> I love the way this cross starts. It's, it's so fun. May I proceed? You may. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm just gonna ask you some questions today and then we'll get you out of here, all right? Okay, thank you. And you know that your dad is on trial for murder today. Yeah, I do. You love your dad, don't you? Of course. You care about him a lot. Mm hmm You agree with me that today you are testifying on his behalf, right? Right, I'm here to say everything I did with him that day. You are here to say that all voluntarily, right? Yeah. And you agree with me, your daddy raised you for your entire life. Yeah, him and my mom in Philly. You don't want him to spend the rest of his life in prison? No. Would you lie for him? No, ma'am, I, I wouldn't lie for him. You're telling us today you wouldn't lie for your dad? Sorry, I'm sorry, that no. is so, like, I, I'm literally obsessed with Urea. Like, <laughs> something, like no. there is something so there was there, what was so perfect about that pocket is that, like you said, we're both fire, fire, fire means fire, right? And I think that you are someone that has the ability to go super high and super intense. But I think the beauty of that first pocket was that it was super, super low, not low energy, but like more muted than the rest of the cross, right? Like almost like like lulling her into a trap of thinking that this is just about her dad, and also like the jury too, like, like leveling with like this very emotional fact of like, you are testifying for your dad right now. And almost in a way where like, you're on the same side as her. And then out of nowhere, would you lie for him? Like, and it's the tone of the question. It's the tone of the question because that's what everyone has on their mind in that moment. And like, you said, you like the way you say it is like exactly how like we are asking that question to ourselves in our mind in that moment as we're hearing across. So it's just so, so, so perfect and performative. I think that like one of the biggest assets 
one of the things I'm most grateful for that I did in my time as a competitor was I did everything. Like I think too often a mock trial and I hate this mentality so much. People are like, I'm an opener. I'm a closer. I cross defendants. I cross experts, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's so damaging because if you, everyone should do everything at some point, whether or not that ends up being your niche that you do on like your stack team or whatever, who cares? Like I always directed and crossed experts when I was competing in stack season for Emory. I knew that that was what I was going to do. That said, I have also character witnessed. I have also experted. I have middled. I've opened. I've closed. I've done sad witness crosses. I've done it like defendant crosses. Like I think that having to do all of that, then in moments like this, where you have to draw on like something that's not your niche really, really sets you up well. And it also just helps you better understand like how to do good mock trial in different parts of the trial in different ways. Like, like I was able to take stuff from like defendant crosses and imbue it into expert crosses and closes. I was able to take moments that like attitudes and styles I had to cultivate for sad witness crosses and put it into closes too. Like it all helps. So like if you're someone who thinks that like you have to close all the time or open all the time, that's just not true. Like, even if it's not the thing that you end up doing for the betterment of your program later, like spend a tournament or two doing something that you've never done before, because you'll learn something from it. Even if you suck at it, I'm the worst character witness in the world, but I still learned a lot of useful lessons from having to do it for a couple of tournaments. Yeah, I think that's true. And I also think there's two sort of um, roster construction things that people don't think about that are instructive on that point. And the first is, I think opening is harder than closing. I agree. And I, I think, and I think opening matters more to some degree. I agree too. Um, number one. Number two, I think it's silly to give your best competitor the, the best exam. Like, uh, I don't know that it makes a ton of sense to give the Travis or Rhea of the team, like the big defendant cross, because sometimes it's easy. Like maybe give your less experienced competitor that cross and maybe the really tough character witness cross where there's just not a lot of content. Maybe you give that to Travis so you can go, get up there and Travis starting the cross and it scores a 10. Um, and so number one, I, I agree with you. Like when you're doing like a trial by combat or a top gun, it's useful to have all those sort of tools in your, in your arsenal, but also I just don't think it makes a ton of sense always to, to do those sorts of roles. And you want to think about why you're doing certain things and whether it makes sense for your team. Um, and certainly it may not always make sense for development and things like that, particularly when you're a younger competitor to do more, try, try different things, middle do both speeches. I totally agree with you, Rhea. Mm -hmm. You actually did lie for him, right? No, I definitely didn't lie for him. It's your testimony today. You definitely did not lie for your father. Do I have that right? That's right, ma'am. Ma'am, let's talk about what you said to the police when they investigated you. Cause you'd agree with me. They interviewed you, right? Yeah during your dad's murder investigation. They did. You agree with me, they asked you questions about your father's whereabouts. Sure. They asked you questions about your father's whereabouts the night that Mr. Capello was murdered, right? Right, they asked if he was in the hotel that night. Not only that, ma'am, they asked you if you were with him that night, right? That's right. Now, a couple of months ago you said that you didn't tell the police at first exactly where you were, right? Yeah, I grabbed the legal pad for that. Like I, said, I didn't, I didn't mention right. that party at first. Did, did you even look at it? You, I, I don't think you got me to grab it. Well, I didn't want my to do that. Too, yeah. I, I don't even think you looked at exactly it. You <laughs> I, I think do that too. Like, yeah. I bet I had. I bet here's what happened. I bet I had my script on it, and then I was trying to do a little trick um, to remember the rest of the cross. There's parts of this where like the delivery sounds like odd. Like I like emphasize weird words and questions and I've just been noticing it's because I didn't remember the script and so like it just like happens as the words are coming so I guarantee that the little legal pad trick there was just I'm pretty sure I had the cross like, on the legal pad. watch your eyes I don't even think you look down <laughs> at it yeah um like I said I didn't mention hey, I mean, that okay, part okay. Oh, oh, memorizing the script, memorizing <laughs> script. <laughs> I had snuck out successfully and well I didn't want my parents to know well let's talk about what exactly you said at first ma'am at first you said that you were with your father the entire night, right? That's right. Then the police, they pulled up some text messages, right? I just want to yeah, shout out that uh, me and Rhea did like the exact same hand movement like, like multiple times. Like I forget what it would was, but in my cross, I also went like this, like for some long distance, and then Rhea did the exact same thing. Further, oh God, Travis, it's better than this. Apparently, I did this like yeah. on the final, like a hang ten for whatever reason.
This that that gesture reminds me of like a, uh, when you're posing with a character at Walt at like Disney World, and they're like, <laughs> like your family. <laughs> Uh, good gesture. Really liked it. I liked it in both both crosses. The text from my friend with the invite, and then my Uber receipt. So I, I just told him what happened. Well, hold on, man. Well, we're gonna take those one at a time. First, they just pulled out those text messages, right? Yeah. And then you changed your story. Well, that's when I told him about the party. Well, ma'am, first you said that you were gone for an hour because of that party, right? Mm-hmm. Ma'am, that's one hour you were. So I will say, I'm not sure how this witness would have scored on an the ballot. However, Juliana is 100% playing this how the real witness would be. Like, this is 100% how this witness agree. would be in real life. Like, sort of like, um, like you, you like her. She's like sort of feel feels like she's the, the, the daughter, but she's also like a little bit mad at you, but like not that mad. Um, I thought she did. I think she does a really good job. This is the, like I always talk about on the show, I hate the over-the-top witnesses, and I like the witnesses who were like super credible. This is the kind of witness that I, I think is the way, like what this is the kind of witness that should score well. She's playing the character exactly how it should be played, and she's doing it really credibly. I also Not think like in the case, <clears throat> sorry, I think in the case, this witness was hard to cross in general. Not because like I felt like the cop, like for example, like the cop cross. I love Travis's cop cross, but that like, we took very different approaches on how we did our cop crosses. And I saw different approaches in other rounds. So like everyone took a different angle, I think on the cop, everyone was doing more or less like the same exact cross with this witness. Oh my God. I already forget her name. Lauren Shepard. Yeah. Lauren Shepard. Lauren Shepard. Yeah. Lauren Shepard. Lauren Shepard. Um, Lauren Shepard. Everyone was pretty much doing the same thing. And so I think like it the the point it was all basically for the every single person like one except give or take maybe a couple like one long you're a liar cross and it got really tricky for a lot of places and I think I'm almost lucky that I had I crossed Bennett the first time and then Juliana was the second time that I did this cross and like Bennett was like super wiggly and so I think by virtue of having to do him the first time I had a good like strategy in mind for like, you really have to break up a lot of like when you're dealing with this witness in particular, I think like really walk it through in a way that seems like excessive in the moment, but like is necessary then for the cross to hit. Um, and so, I don't know, this was an interesting one. Like there's not a ton to work with. So I think it's funny you were saying earlier, Phil, that like sometimes you just need to like stretch it out. Um, but yeah, this was a really interesting one. Did you see anyone start their cop cross by saying, ma'am, why are you wearing a badge with your suit? <laughs> no, but Ollie Electra and our cop direct made me ask him why he was wearing an FBI jacket. Really? <laughs> yeah. What, what was the answer? <laughs> oh my God. It was so crazy. Ollie, like, so I directed Ollie um, in round four and Ollie directed me in round three. Both were equally crazy. Round three, like it was utter shenanigans because I told Ollie that I was going to play the witness as like a sad, like tearful witness, sort of like, like very emotional. I didn't do that. I basically said like, my dad was an ugly loser who like couldn't have committed the murder. That's not a paraphrase. I think I actually said that among many other absurd things. Ollie didn't know that I was going to do it that way. So he was taken aback when I started doing the direct next round. I direct Ollie. <clears throat> and then he's like, and I said, like, is there anything you need me to ask you? And then he said, yeah, just ask me two questions. Ask me about my accent and then ask me about my jacket. And then I was like, any reason why? And he's like, I have things prepared. And then when I asked him about his accent, he like did like a cute little like Ollie joke. When I asked him about his jacket, or no, he said, he said something like, like, oh yeah, like I can't tell you where I'm from. All I can tell you is that like, there's a reason the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like something like that. It was so I heard about this. I encourage everyone to go watch Ollie's Witness in round four. It's like a time. It's really good. Ollie's obviously a fantastic witness, but that was like, I think the whole room was laughing. Like I didn't know he was going to say that. So what did he say about the jacket? He said like, my wife gave it to me. My wife works for the FBI. And like, I accidentally put on her jacket this morning when I left the house. Um, that was post Soviet <laughs> Union joke. So it was quite- Just totally quiet. gratuitous. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. That was a lie, wasn't it? Right. Like I, like I said, then they showed me my Uber and I, I knew I just, I had to tell them I was really gone for longer than an hour. Ma'am, you lied to the police during your father's murder investigation. Right. I, I didn't want my parents to know what had happened. I, I thought they might freak out at me. I was 17 at the time, still a junior. 
Travis, I actually don't remember. Did we have you guys select the witnesses for the semifinal or was it? No, they were given to us for the semi and then we picked for the final. Hmm, yeah. I don't remember how we picked those witnesses. They, I think it was the people that were like right under in ranking. Five, six, maybe. We, well, it, it must have been five and six because because the, in, the, in the other round it was Charlie Stock and I don't remember. Oh, and Liz Grant. Um, it was probably five, six, seven. I would yeah. guess. Let me just make sure I have this clear, man. You were worried your father would freak. Well, that worked out really well. These witnesses were really good at these two roles. Yeah. It, like kind of worked out perfectly. Juliana is perfect in this role. And Sarah was really good as the marshal. Out that you lied about a party when he was being investigated for murder. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I was. And then you lied for him during that interview, right? Well, no, ma'am. I wasn't lying for him. Well, you lied about where you were that night. Right? Right. Because then, like you said, the police showed you those Uber receipts, right? Mm-hmm. And then you change your story what? again. Yeah, like that. <laughs> right. What? The, what, what were you, what were you <laughs> Well, I, honestly, wait. But Rhea, I think that, like, I, those, I, I think that one thing that goes under One thing that's one thing that's underrated in mock trial is, like, how people use, like, not just, like, like, in volume and like like how whether they're loud or quiet but literally the pitch of their voice and like if they're going higher or lower because like i think i'm someone like when i'm competing i'm talking like i i go to the very top of my range like multiple times i think it literally just makes you sound interesting to listen to I and i think that like it, like we can joke about the uber ratings but like i would have done the exact same thing like <laughs> like it literally is just like i think that like, your cadence of speaking just like uses like so many more parts of your voice which i think is like another reason why you're just so interesting to listen to like you said the police showed you those uber receipts right mm -hmm. and then you <laughs> change your story again right now you were gone from that hotel for four hours that night, right? Yeah, that, that's right, from 11.30 to 3. That is four hours you were not with your father. Yeah. Four hours you cannot account for his whereabouts, true? Sure, I wasn't with him then. So ma'am, you cannot tell us where he was during that four hour period, correct? Well, I, I left him in the hotel, but I wasn't with him. Ma'am, I wanna talk about why that's important for this case, you know your dad knew someone named Barry Capello, right? Mm-hmm, um, Uncle Barry. He didn't like Barry Capello. Well, he did for a few years, but um, not not as of 2018. That's right, ma'am, as of 2018, things changed, right? Right, um, Uncle Barry said some things about my family, things that weren't true, and um, yeah, they, they stopped being friends. Ma'am, you'd agree with me, Uncle Barry testified in court under oath against your family, right? Objection, Your Honor, to speculation. As to? As to this witness's testimony about that trial, she wasn't there. Response? You may. Your Honor, we believe that this witness has personal knowledge that that trial, in fact, did occur. She didn't need to be there. If she doesn't know, she can say she doesn't know. Response, Your Honor? You may. We need to hear the foundation as to why Ms. Lafaraji believes she would know that. Do it. Who told her about it? Response? Sure. Now, this is cross-examination. If the witness doesn't know, if she wasn't there for the trial, if she doesn't even know that it occurred, she can say that. I agree. Overruled. Yes, sir. You'd agree with me. Your Uncle Barry testified against your family under oath. Isn't that true? He did. Let's talk about what he said. He said that her cousin <coughs> was a murderer. Yeah, that's what he said. He said your dad was a mob boss, right? Yeah, I mean, I have no idea why he said that, but that's what he said in the trial. You agree with me, that made your dad pretty upset, didn't it? Objection, Your Honor. This question calls for speculation. Response? It's so speculation. That was so that was <laughs> okay, I don't know why I did that. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was like totally speculation. Here's the thing. Yeah. What I didn't understand, like, so in the moment, I remember like thinking I was totally right on the objection for the first one. I now actually listen to your argument. You were right, I think, on the lack of foundation. Like, I really didn't do that. And that's one of those things where I say, like, this is why my second chair was a godsend to me during this competition. There's a lot of times, especially during objections, where I'm just like, no, I just don't understand what you're trying to say. But now looking back, the lack of foundation I, one, I think, was really smart. The speculation one, I was totally speculative. I should have just changed the way I said the question. <laughs> Said that, yeah, I should have also changed, I should have made my ground speculation properly. I should have just started at lack of foundation. And like also, but also the thing is that it was a statement from the defendant and like, 
it, it would have gone in anyway. So I don't even know why I made that objection. So. <laughs> She's asking him about her father's opinions and feelings towards another person. If she has a quote or something that she remembers him saying, she can testify to that. She can't testify to his state of mind. Uh, yeah, sustained as raised. Yes, Your Honor. You'd agree with me that to you, he appeared pretty angry after that. I love the meme. Like, have you ever seen the meme there where it's like duct tape on like a huge hole of like a, and, like, <laughs> whatever? It's like speculation and then like appeared. And like, I always tell my students like, like, just because they say the word appear doesn't mean anything like they get to say anything they want after that. <laughs> but most judges buy it. I don't did did Tra I don't remember. Did Travis reobject? I, I guess we'll find out. After this, Travis. I don't think I reobject. I think I got what I, I don't I don't think my brain was thinking that much. Like I just won the objection. I was like thinking about like if I was going to do a redirect, honestly. Yeah, I feel like at TBC for objections, like your brain is so much in this mode. This is like this exact thing happened to me during my round four with Maddie. It's like because objections is a check, you're no longer thinking in terms of like, do I want this evidence in or out? You're thinking of, have I made the bear? Like, I feel like most people going into TVC have this like rule for themselves. At least I did. I'm sure other people do as well, where it's like, I need to make at least two objections this trial. Once I've done two, I've done the, like the amount of work I need to have a good shot at winning the objections check. Like you don't view it like versus for like AMTA competitions. I don't see objections that way. Like for AMTA competitions, and this is like a hot take. Like a lot of people don't agree with me on this, but for AMTA competitions, I'm always like, if something sounds objectionable, I'll object. If something doesn't sound objectionable, then I won't object. Like I just object if something is objectionable. But for TBC, because you have this thing where like you need to object. I think that like once you've made your set amount, you don't push yourself to do more and you don't, you know, at least that's been my experience. It's a strategy call for sure. And I also think some judges may interpret that check differently. I mean, some people may give you points for um, not objecting to certain things. Or on the flip side, you may lose points by objecting to certain things. You know, why did you object to that? It's clearly coming in or it doesn't really hurt you or yeah, it's annoying, like whatever. Like, especially like objecting when it's unnecessary is a big thing that like I hate. Like when I judge competitions now, I take point like – if I think an objection is like, they just made it because they wanted to object. It's like obvious. Like I can tell usually. And I like, don't necessarily like it. I'm sometimes I dock points for that. If it's like a really stupid objection, like it's so like, I don't know. I, I don't like buy the philosophy that you object to throw off the flow or interrupt people. Cause I think it sometimes can hurt you if it's a really bad objection. I think it's silly. I also think when you're like a real lawyer, it's like some lawyers would say it's unethical. Yeah. Um, so I don't coach my teams to like, you know, make a relevance objection to like get in the way of Travis's cross. Like I, I it's not a thing I think is effective yeah, in, exactly. in real life or in, in mock trial. I, I agree with you, Rio. And I think that like, if you, I feel like if, if you know the rules like well enough also, like I, I genuinely believe that like, even if it's something procedural or small, like there usually is like a valid objection to make like at some point at some point in time sometimes there's just not and someone has to object and prove their stuff like really 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 well but like there's at least like something like i think experts is an example of this like like you can always throw in like a solid like 702c objection and like argue as to like reliability of a method like and, and that's a valid like yeah like the conclusion is definitely going to come in but like it is like a valid objection that like like is like actually has merit as opposed to something that like you're just objecting to just to like throw up throw up the flow you know right yeah i i think he was hurt about what barry was saying ma'am to you he appeared pretty upset sure he appeared furious sure <laughs> after that he said uncle Seemed. barry is a rat that's right said, I never want to hear that rat's name again. Mm -hmm. He said, Barry Capello is dead to our family. That's what he said. Nothing further on. Excellent use of pauses. Like right before that pause, right before that last question was so important. It's so, so funny important. because before round, it's, it's actually, it's funny. It's almost a good thing that like, um, you're doing for the other episode, the Thomas and Bennett round. So like after, I don't even think they know this. I never told Bennett this after that round was done. Elias like took me outside in the hallway and he was like, Rhea, like you have a fatal flaw, like going into your next rounds, you need to pause like Bennett Dembski, like you go too fast. Like you have to like, listen to like, you, you need to do it like that in your next round. And then I stole the wrong thing from Bennett. I didn't actually steal the pause. I stole other things, but like, 
like I think like like it wasn't until the semis that I like had a minute to like let that sink in I think and I really tried to like feel the room um in that round in the semi round four semis and final I think I tried to like use the space and like feel the space a little bit more and now like as a coach that's the biggest thing that I usually tell like the kids at USC that like silence is such a useful tool and it's often underutilized so like when I'm seeing like these crazy text heavy like 10 minute speeches I'm like something is wrong here because like it shouldn't be like that so I think like generally like silence is a tool that people don't use nearly as often enough as they should this was the closest round in trial by combat history um it came it was three to three we we dropped the judge's ballot as many people watching this probably know and it came down to I think a check mark um which uh is insane uh and but watching those crosses back I think kind of is right um that that's how close it was those crosses were really good um and just a really good semifinal. I think one of the best rounds, regardless of um, it being close on the, on the ballots and check marks, I just think one of the best rounds we've had. Um, I would uh, ask you guys if this was on par with where have you been, but I think we got to give the audience uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, oh no, <laughs> no way. No <laughs> way. All right. <laughs> Oh my god. They're in COVID with the mask. Oh my gosh. I've been everywhere, man, looking for someone. Someone who can please. Is that an actual crowd? Yeah, this is actually at our concert. Um, and we like took the audio and like um uh put it on YouTube. So you guys have like a whole choreography and everything too? Not for every song, but because we were doing this for the competition, it has choreo. So we actually had three songs that had choreo. Yeah. People are probably, people like, are probably yelling at me for talking over this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a good part. This is a fun part. <laughs> so I have a technical question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how is it acapella if there's like some instruments? There are no instruments. That's actually both all beatboxing. All the oh acapella. wow, really? Yeah. So <laughs> um, our our vocal percussionist Elliot like basically is like a like crazy like once in a lifetime like has won so many awards for like beatboxing. He like does this crazy siren sound effect like not in this song. <laughs> And it, like he can do so, like he can sound like a grasshopper, like make all these different sounds. It's so cool. Elliot's the one in the middle. It's so funny, Travis, like seeing you do it. Like, like people who do mock trial, it's almost like seeing a teacher outside of school. I like can't imagine you guys doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, no, what even crazier is, so is like this insane person literally goes to nationals, wins nationals one week later, two weeks later, one week later, right? One like, week later. It's insane. Like one week later, after go straight from Lancaster, Philadelphia to New York City where then they do this, like, it's actually crazy. To, de to then win second place, like, that's utterly crazy. And and also- and it was really tight. Like, like I, like, this show was fantastic. Like, I've, I don't know, I've never, like, seen an acapella thing before, but it was so cool. I obsessively stalk the opportunities on YouTube. They're like, incredible, but- I think, I think everyone like, will know. The full set watching, like, they did this song and they did, like, four others and it was so good. Um, But yeah, it was, it was crazy. So, like- 
super super but like the craziest thing to me is that just like travis did this like back to back and so successful about it it was so crazy um okay wait this is actually the fun note i'll, I'll let this play and then i'll have a fun trivia fact okay okay <laughs> good good tease that's what we in the yes. radio business call tease yes Okay, yeah, I was going to talk about. <laughs> I just want to hear the note. Um, Tell us. Actually, so Nicole, who Jessica, who is um, was our opener in the final round and is our current captain of Harvard Mock Trial, actually has a twin sister that also goes to Harvard, who happens to be in the Opportunes as well. Um, and it was really funny because Jessica joined Mock Trial, and the next year, like they both came back to campus, and we actually Opportunes did not auditions my fresh their freshman year, my sophomore year because of COVID. And we came back the next semester, and I was hanging out with Jessica, and then I found out that her sister sang, and I was like, oh my god, you should join the opportunities wouldn't that be so crazy if like one twin was in mock trial and the other was in my acapella group and then like that's exactly what happened and now like I literally see their family like almost every weekend because they they live in New Jersey so they come up like like for the concert and then the competition and then the gig and then the competition so I see them a lot um, it's just super fun um yeah is that the beatboxer guy in the middle yeah didn't he also win at the nat like the national one, Travis? Like he got an individual award too. Yeah, he won out like basically like best vocal percussionist nationally, basically. So this is like is there like a set dance for this party? You guys do whatever you want for this part. So um, <laughs> we actually changed this to the actual competition because it kind of was awkward because we were just standing around. And in the actual thing, we like walk back and forth so that we're not just awkwardly standing there. <laughs> I can't believe I'm watching this. <laughs> Worlds collide. It's a crossover episode. <laughs> first ever, the first ever Watchmont crossover episode. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> that was the best thing we've ever watched. <laughs> no offense, everyone. That's so <laughs> funny. Thank you for playing it. That this is so like it literally is like a collision of worlds. I'm so happy. <laughs> uh well, thank you guys for coming on. I'm not sure anything will ever top that, but uh that was awesome. Um Travis, we're we're looking forward to to your return to to competition, uh, and maybe you two will get to face each other at nationals uh, in a in a coach competitor setting. I Travis, guess. maybe I'll judge you. Who's gonna call the conflict? Well, that's, who's gonna call the conflict? <laughs> I mean, uh, thank you guys so much for for coming on. I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll have have you on. Uh, hopefully, Travis, we're talking to you. Um, in the spring about uh, potentially trial by combat 2023. Yeah, um, definitely. Like, like I said, like, I'm so excited for it. Um, hoping, hoping that the stars line and that I can get a job and then figure it out and then do trial by combat. <laughs> uh, good luck with the rest of the invitational season and uh, with regionals that are right around the corner and we'll be talking soon, I'm sure. Yep. Thank you.